Hi there viewers, hope you're doing well. In the world of underwater videography, I previously focused a lot on how to capture images, but the truth is I spent at least as much time here in front of the computer editing them. And with that in mind, I'd like to teach you all a few tips and tricks that I've picked up over the years that will significantly improve your workflow. And the tips we're gonna look at today includes how to import and back up your footage, how to create new sequences, some of my favorite keyboard shortcuts, um, export settings, and finally, don't fall in love with the wrong edit. So with all that in mind, I will be using Adobe Premiere Pro, but pretty much whatever I show you here can be done with other editing softwares as well. So let's get started. Importing and backing up your footage should be the first order of business whenever you're starting a new project. Once you have your footage imported onto your computer, tablet, or phone, I tend to follow quite a set workflow. First, I start by reviewing all the shots step by step, maybe with something like uh, VLC. And that will just allow me to go through it and filter out any shots that maybe I consider unsuccessful, like maybe shots that are out of focus, uh, too shaky or otherwise shots that I'm not sure that I want to use in my final edits or for any other projects. So I've already gone ahead and deleted them, but basically that will be my first step. Next, we can start backing everything up. So backing up your footage is essential. I can't stress this enough. So you want to have a second hard drive with enough space for all the footage to go onto. Some editors will also create a third backup either on another drive or on a cloud-based service, but two separate backups is minimum. Next, you wanna make sure all that footage successfully copied to the second drive. There can be an issue with creating backups sometimes. If you don't wanna look through all your footage again, at least make sure that all the thumbnails load for all your different shots. And here's an extra pro tip for you. Keep all the original footage on your memory card at least until you've gotten two copies of all your footage. Okay, so once you've sorted through your footage, you can import it into your editing software. Here we got Premiere Pro. This is usually quite straightforward. Either drag or drop or head into the import button. So if you drag and drop, you can select everything and just drop it into here and it'll import the files. Uh, alternatively, you can go into file and import, or you can see there's also a shortcut control I uh, your last option is to double click somewhere in the menu here and it brings up the import um, section as well. And then what we want to do is put all our footage into a folder. So let's just open up a folder and call it footage. And then we'll uh, hit control A, select all the footage and just drop it into here. So now we can collapse that. Once the footage is loaded, we wanna create a new timeline so we can start to edit it. This is the timeline section. In Premiere Pro, that feature is called Sequence. Um, there's a few different ways of creating one. You can go ahead and create a new sequence from the drop-down menu, uh, then search for the um, preset here that suits your footage best. This requires you to know a fair bit about your footage, like the resolution and frame rate, and then finding the perfect preset for that specific footage. But there's another way of doing this as well that's a lot quicker and easier. So we're just gonna cancel this. So all this footage is shot at the same um, settings. It's shot at 4K and 50 frames. Uh, actually, let me go ahead first and just um, interpret that to 25 frames. Who doesn't want 50% slow motion, am I right? And then we can just go ahead and grab the folder uh, we imported and drop that into the little icon at the bottom of the panel. And voila. So that just gave us all our footage here in the timeline. That's all the audio that's connected to it. And this now works pretty great. So this is a very easy way to just get exactly the right settings when you're setting up a new sequence. So let me go ahead and rename this because now it has the same name as the folder. Let's call this uh, Andy's Amazing Underwater Footage. Let's hope it's amazing. But maybe you don't want to keep these settings. Maybe you want to create a 1080p sequence instead. Well, 
Uh, if we mark our sequence here, we can go into the sequence settings and we can basically adjust these numbers, which is the uh, resolution of 4K. And we can change that into 1920 by 1080. And if we hit OK, what happens is that this footage will now be scaled in 50% because it is larger than full HD. Um, so we can go ahead and scale our clips down. The way we do that, we select one of them and we go over to um, effect controls here and we change the scale to 50. That brings it back down. If you put it lower than that, you'll start to get black bars around here. We don't want that. And then we can just copy those motion settings. And if we click in this window and say control A, that selects all the clips and then control V that pastes those settings. And now all this footage looks great in full HD. Okay, so now that we have our sequence set up and we've already used a bit of the shortcut keys, let's move on to keyboard shortcuts. And this is actually something of a game changer because if you find uh, a set of keyboard settings that work good for you, it can be such a game changer and it can save you so much time. And the standard keyboard shortcuts from your editing software probably isn't really optimized for quick editing. So let's have a look at some of the settings we can change. And by the way, if you do these changes and you don't like them, you can always go back to the defaults uh, by just selecting it up here. So to make a few changes here, we want to go into the keyboard shortcuts, which brings us to this keyboard menu here. Now we are not actually doing that many changes to the keyboard. We're going to change a few important settings to help us have a much smoother workflow. So below the keyboard here, we have all these different button shortcuts and we can also search up buttons here. So let's start by searching for uh, ripple delete. Um, now this will probably have a different shortcut on your computer, but I have it mapped to the Q button. So change that to Q. Uh, next we'll search for ripple trim next. Okay, there it is. Next edit to playhead. That's a long one. And we'll change this one to W. Then we'll go ahead and search for uh, go to next edit point. And we'll map that to E. And then we'll have go to previous edit point and we'll map that to R. Next is um, step back one frame, which is the one on the top here. And we're gonna map that one to A and then we're gonna have step forward one frame mapped to D. And then finally, we're gonna add, change one more button, which is the add edit, whoops. And we're gonna change that one to S. And before we continue, you can save all these settings as a preset, so you don't lose them if you choose to revert back to another keyboard layout. So if you choose save as, you can name that whatever you want, and that's your preset. Okay, so basically we've now changed these seven keys that are located on the top left corner of your keyboard. Nice. So let me show you how to use these keys. We'll click OK here. Let's start with the um, A and D keys. Let's zoom in here a bit. So the A and D keys, all they do is move backwards and forwards one frame. And if you just hold them in, I'm holding in the A key, it goes backwards. And if you hold in the D key, it goes forwards. All right, then we got the E and the R keys. And these will jump forward or backwards to your next playhead or your next clip. So if I choose E, it will jump over to there. And if I choose R, it'll jump back over to there. I actually mapped the E button to be the next playhead, which might seem a bit odd as the R button is then for previous playhead, but I mostly use this next playhead button, so I have that mapped to the E. The Q button will ripple delete anything that is highlighted, meaning it will delete the clip and bring the next clip forward. So let's say I'm not happy with this clip, I highlight it and I click the Q button and it's gone. The W key does a similar thing, except it creates a cut at your current highlighted clip and brings the next clip up to it. So if I'm watching through this clip here a bit and say, uh, yeah, this previous bit was what I wanted, 
and then if it's highlighted and I click W, the next clip comes up and it leaves this previous footage where it is. Great. Um, then we get to the S key, which simply creates a cut anywhere the playhead is resting. So let's jump ahead a little bit to a different clip. Something more fun. This is from the uh, HTMS Chang, by the way. I did a video on that recently. You should go check it out. Amazing dive, as you can see. So let's say I'm playing around here, and I want to cut to start right about here. I'll hit S, which creates a cut here. And if I keep playing along, then I could create another cut here. And now I've essentially isolated this clip. Now these shortcuts, together with the spacebar for start and stop, will take some getting used to, but once you have, it'll just speed up your workflow significantly. So go ahead and try it and see what you think. And if you happen to find any other buttons that I've missed, please let me know. So let's say you completed your edit and now it's time to export. Choosing the right export setting is really important to make your video look as good as possible. Some editing software comes with presets for things like Facebook and YouTube. And if your software has that, great, just go ahead and use it. But in case you don't have presets or you want to learn a little bit more, well, allow me to show you. First off, we're going to bring up the export settings either by clicking Control M or we can go ahead and click File, uh, Export, Media. Let's just start from the top here with formats. That looks overwhelming. But fear not, you can safely ignore most of this. We will look at two of them starting with QuickTime. Here you can get stuff like Apple ProRes settings if you're using an updated version of Adobe Premiere. This, however, is more for advanced users. The other format option that you will probably use more is called H.264. In the presets, you can find some options for high quality 1080p or 4K video, and also some for matching sources, etc., etc. If you're on an older version of Premiere, you might also get presets down here for YouTube, Facebook, Vimeo, and other social media platforms like it. For some reason, those disappeared when I updated. But no worries, a quick Google search will give you the best settings for each of them, and all you have to do is create your own presets. So we can take a look at this um, YouTube 1080p preset that I've made here, and I'll show you the important settings you need to check out. First off, we got the width and the length of Full HD 1920 by 1080. So considering this is a full HD preset, I've made that specific, but if this preset was going to be used for different kinds of resolutions, you can just click the match source button here and it will always be the same as your sequence settings. Then we get to frame rate. Again, you can just click this box if you want to always have it match your sequence settings. Field order is pretty much always progressive these days, unless you're working on footage from older cameras, like 10 plus years old or so. And the aspect ratio, again, is mostly 1.0 these days. The TV standards depends on your frame rate choices. Most likely, if you're shooting NTSC, you're in the States, and PAL, you're almost uh, anywhere else in the world. Then we get to the button that says Render at Maximum Depth. By all means, feel free to tick it. It will give you slightly improved exports. But also be aware that if your computer is slow, it will add a significant amount of time to your exports. Next, we got profile and level here, and this is usually set differently depending on who you are exporting to. For YouTube 1080p, they want it in uh, main and 4.1. And then we can ignore all of this until we get to bitrate settings. This essentially tells Premiere how large the final file size will be. You might think bigger is better, and yes, kind of, but it gets to a point where larger file sizes no longer helps with quality. So for YouTube 1080p, they want VBR2 pass, meaning it will go through it twice, and both target and max bitrate at 35. Next, you can click the use maximum render quality, but again, it might add significant render time to slower computers. And voila, that's it. Hit the export button to start exporting straight away, or choose Q if you want to send it off to Adobe Media Encoder. This makes sense if you're exporting multiple edits at the same time. The final tip is really important because it's one I've been guilty of so many times and it's don't fall in love with your edits. It's easy to get to the end of your video and think like because you put so much time and effort into it, the video is now done, but there's always room for improvement. 
So what I always do is rewatch my videos loads of times because usually the first two, you are just admiring it in a way. But then you start to see little things that you can improve upon. Maybe switch a couple of clips around, fix some of the audio, or maybe that color just looks off. Whatever it is, having the mindset that your video isn't finished just because you've reached the end is so important. Hope you enjoyed this video. In the future, I'm doing a video about color correcting underwater footage in Premiere Pro. So if you don't wanna miss out on that, please remember to hit that subscribe button. All right, thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.